Hello my fellow geeks and nerds, it's Christy and it's time for another lecture on how to social science. This is going to be the starting lecture for the 202 course and I have previously done uh, the philosophy of social science as well as the 201 course on qualitative. In today's quantitative lecture we're going to be examining the idea of content analysis which is a way that social scientists and in particular people who are interested in media communications whether it's from the political science side or from the more societal side translate language and text into numbers that are appropriate for quantitative analysis. And then we're going to start looking at the basic terminology and language and premise around descriptive statistics and how we organize data, how data can be thought of as the forms that it takes and how that then will determine the kinds of analysis that can be done with it. If that doesn't make sense now, it's okay. By the end of the lecture, it will. Starting with content analysis, Regardless of a, whether we're talking about survey data or like looking at media data, say uh, characterizing articles in a newspaper or counting up how many times a story appears on television, one of the fundamental things that we do in quants is we translate qual into quants. So we're moving from a textual analysis in, into a numerical analysis that allows us to make more generalized statements about the data that we're looking at and also to do inferential testing that allows us to generalize to the wider population. In order to do that with something like media analysis, um, then you have to basically create preset categories that will allow you to quantify the content according to those preset categories. Content analysis also aims to be systematic. If you do content analysis, someone should be able to replicate your results. And the other thing about content analysis is it's the most quality of the quants form of statistical analysis. It can and often should use some elements of qualitative analysis to help you distinguish between tones of voice or positive and negative coverage. Things that we can we can um, we can look at quantitatively, but we have to actually contextualize qualitatively. According to Halstey, content analysis is any technique for making inferences by objectively and systematically identifying specifi specified characteristics of messages. And in this example, I'm going to be looking at the content analysis from press coverage during the 2001 British general election that was conducted by the British election study team. That wasn't the team I was on, that was the election cycle before I participated in, in the 2005 study. Like any form of scientific analysis, specifying the research question and following these steps will provide you with far more precise and interesting information than very vague statements and unidentified, not very well identified theory, data, or whatnot. So a research question, if it's well specified, will allow you to narrow down the scope of your study. It could be deductive, so you might have a theory that you want to create a hypothesis for and gather data for and then test to see if your theory is can be is it will do a good job of accounting for the variation in your observations or it could be inductive you might be looking at the number of women who become journalists over time and want to evaluate where they appear most and what content they appear most in so you won't have a theory in that case you'll be led by the data your research question will inform the coding schema that you have. It will also, very importantly, help you help you narrow down your sampling size. And when it comes to media, that can be impressively um, intimidating when you look at how much content that you could possibly have to code. And also, it might narrow down the time frame that your data is actually you need to collect for. And so, having a good research question will help you answer each one of these questions. Things that could be covered by a content analysis. And again, here we're talking about media coverage in any form. Could be visual, could be radio, could be text. You could also probably apply this, a lot of these things now, to social media. And questions that are quite typical are who gets covered, what gets reported, and what does not get reported. Where is the coverage? The types of media. Is it in tabloids or broadsheets, online or offline? Where is the location of the media? Is it on the front page, the opinion page, the local page? Is it the top story? Is it the closing story in a, in a broadcast situation? 
how long is the time frame or when is the coverage? Does the subject matter continue on? Like, is it a long ongoing debate or does it emerge and fade very quickly? How much coverage does it get? Are we talking here about the number of column inches, the number of minutes that are broadcast, or the number of days? These are things that you have to specify in your question in order to better collect your data. You could also look at why is it covered? Is there a framing to the story? Is there a, guy, a bad guy and a good guy? Is the use of language in the article neutral or is it incendiary? These are all ways that you can think about framing your question or the th kinds of things that your question can answer when looking at media content. For this example, I'm looking at something that was done by an election study on the media, but content analysis can also be done on reports by organizations or other forms of writing or any kind of form of communication. So although I'm framing it in terms of newspapers and elections, please don't think this is the only way that content analysis can be used. It can be used in many different ways and increasingly it's being used to evaluate social media patterns. So the tradition that came out of analyzing media is being adopted and adapted to fit the analysis of people's behavior on social media. An important part of your content analysis is selecting your sample. This is going to be a representative, smaller portion of the total body of evidence that you have available to you. And if your subject is the media, it is very helpful if in your research question you narrow things down in such a way that allows you to answer what do you mean by the media? Because if we're just looking at newspapers, that in and of itself includes broadsheets, tabloid papers, you could include or exclude the Sunday papers, you could include or exclude free newspapers that are available in your cities. Are you going to look at local papers or only national papers? Are you going to look at the whole paper or just sections of the paper? Are you going to include the opinion page? Are you going to include letters to the editor? As you can see, deciding your sample is going to be a very important part of your research in order to make sure that you don't spend 15 years trolling through everything when you didn't need to. Here is a quick list of how the BES team in 2001 coded the samples of data that they had collected as either straight news, news analysis, background, if it was a feature piece, if it was an editorial, if it was an opinion piece, and that way they knew what kind of content that they were analyzing, they coded it according to these categories. Another consideration when doing content analysis is the time frame in which you will collect your data. And this is going to be reflected in your research question. It will also determine the kinds of analysis you can do and the things you can say. For instance, if we consider the American presidential election starting from Trump descended on, on Stair Force One, the escalator in Trump Towers, then you would have a time frame of June 2015 until November 2016. That is a huge amount of time to look at data. So thinking about the time scale will very much um, influence the amount of time it takes for you to work. To reduce that sample size, then you can take a subset of all the possible articles using a random sampling method. So let's say you did want to look at all of the media coverage since Trump came up, came into the race. You could take a specific uh, set of media that you were going to be looking at and considering your data set and take, for instance, five articles from every month randomly from within your sample so that you could track the narrative of Trump's campaign over time. And you can randomly select by, say, starting with one day of the week and then taking an article every so many other day after. For instance, starting with the Tuesday and then selecting from every fourth day after that. Here is what the BES team wrote up in terms of specifying their sampling frame. Content of press news coverage during the general election campaign period 9th of May to the 7th of June 2001. Articles relating to the campaign were identified from eight daily newspapers. These articles included from within the home news pages of the newspapers and, in addition, leaders, editorial, and comment articles referring to the election campaigns. No photographs, paid-for campaign advertisements, diary columns, or articles of less than 50 words, with the exception of front page articles, were included. Things that can be measured using this kind of content analysis. You can look at the type of author, their gender, I would say sex, because they're talking about a, a binary male and female here. The name of the author, the main actor of the person covered in the story, their sex, was it a positive or negative tone? Was there, were there more than one actors? All of these pieces of information can be identified within each article and coded. 
Other things that you can look for are buzzwords. This is the more qualitative side of things. A phrase like hardworking families or pro-abortion or pro-choice. The context around these words, the patterns that appear around the words, are also something that you can examine. For instance, the media noticed in John McCain's fight against Barack Obama, he had used the word fight 18 times in a single campaign speech. That's a kind of qualitative combined with quantitative approach that gives you a sense of the tone of speech in a way that numbers themselves alone could not. To actually do coding on the data, there are a few cr criterion that are important. It should be objective. In other words, the criteria for something to be coded the other way or not should be clear and all things should be treated e equally. It should be systematized throughout the process. So the first article should be treated the same as the middle article and the last article. Your coding rationale should be transparent and the methods you use should be replicable. Now, these coding criterion can be derived either inductively or deductively. You can get it from observation or from theory or both as long as the criteria are then clearly outlined and consistently applied to the data. Often blind coding comparison is used in order to prevent those sorts of slips and also to reduce human bias. Two individuals will obtain the coding criteria as specified by the investigator. They will then go and code the data according to those instructions. Their, their coding work is then compared for discrepancies, so they should have coded everything the same way if there is a clear coding instruction. If not, th these discrepancies are identified, resolved, new rules refining the decision-making process are created, and now the people doing the coding should be made aware of what to do now when they face these you know, discrepancies, what had previously created discrepancies. If you're doing your own coding because you're a master's student or a PhD student and you can't afford to have other people do it for you, then you have to make sure that you are, your coding is systematic and that you don't code as you go. You can't make up new codes as you go along. If you do find a new, new code because you realize after looking at 15 articles there's something that you've been treating as a binary that actually should be its own code or it should be modified or whatever else, then you need to develop that new code, go back to the beginning and code it again. We're now moving on into the beginning of the quants part of the course and in the quants part of the course we will be looking at various forms of descriptive and inferential statistics but to do that you need to know the vocabulary you need to know what various terms mean and in this section called descriptive statistics originally enough we're gonna do just that. Why do we use statistics? The quantitative approach is grounded in the neo-positivist, uh, in positivist and still in terms of making positive statements based in data about the world um, and scientific perspective. We use statistics when we need to meet the scientific standard of falsification. If we have a theory and we want to test it against observable evidence, there's only one way to do that, and that is with statistical analysis. We use statistics when we want to be able to make statements about what large groups of people do, think, or say. In comparison to qualitative research, which really just organizes what a few individuals who have things in common or share common characteristics say and look qualitatively here, the idea of generalizing from a sample to a much larger population can only be done by using inferential statistics. To achieve the goals of one and two, we need a sizable amount of accurate data from which we can draw our inferences, and the most efficient way to do this is through statistical analysis. Statistical methods can be used to summarize or describe a collection of data. When we do that, that is called descriptive statistics. In addition, patterns in the data may be modeled in a way that accounts for randomness and uncertainty in our, ver in our observations. And these observations are then used to draw inferences about the process or population being studied. This is called inferential statistics. Once we've collected data that we think accurately represents the population we are interested in studying, we can do one of two things. We can describe the data, or we can do inferential descriptions that we use to test structural factors which we cannot assess with descriptive statistics alone. For instance, describing the impact of one year of education on income or other things. There are a few types of analysis that we can use with statistical data. 
the first being univariate analysis. This is an analysis of the differences between the cases on only one variable. We can conduct bivariate analysis, describing one variable in terms of another variable, and we can look for patterns of association. We can do this with a cross tabulation. You guys probably have seen that before when you look at polling results, right? When you look at men versus women and their support for Clinton and Trump, you're describing one variable, sex, in terms of another, support for a party leader. And another pattern of association that is often used is bivariate regression. Thirdly, you can look at multivariate analyses, and this, this is examining the interactions among more than two variables on uh, trying to describe a dependent variable or your variable of interest. And there are many, many, many forms of multivariate regression, a few of which we'll be covering on this course. Getting on to descriptive statistics. The role and the purpose of descriptive statistics is to describe the data. It is the weakest form of analysis, and mere description cannot tell us anything about causal relationships between factors. This is the famous phrase, correlation does not equal causation. We're not quite to the bivariate correlation yet, but even here when we're doing a basic cross-tab analysis, we still can't infer things about causal relationships. We can only describe patterns of association. But descriptive statistics are important to orienting ourselves with what is going on within our own data. We can, for instance, look descriptively at rates of literacy across country. We can look at who votes by class. We can look at party approval ratings. All of these things aren't causal in and of themselves, but descriptive describing the data itself as a process still tells us about the population that we are studying. When using descriptive statistics to communicate information about our sample, there are some basic ways that people do this. There is a graphical, representation of the data. That can be with pie charts, bar charts, or histograms. You can use tables or a tabular description, such as with a, a normal kind of table that you set out or cross tabulation. And you can also look at summary statistics. You can look at the mean, the median, or the mode. First, uh, some terms. What do I mean by a variable? Well, here it's a measure of a quality or characteristics on which people can vary. That might be age and years, income and dollars, partisan identification, the region of the world that you live, or your country that you live in. Uh, if you're a member of a religion, what religion is that? Do you express uh, liberal or authoritarian views? What are your economic very evaluations? These are all things on which people can vary that we can categorize and use their variation to predict other things about their attitudes or their behaviors. When we're looking at data, it's often numerical data, and that numerical representation try, captures the concepts or things within that variable that can take many different forms. And knowing the kind of the data that you have will determine, in some cases, the kinds of analysis that you can run. So looking at it, the richest data is interval level data, sometimes called scale data, and that is age and years you get a very precise 12 month period of time and then you change to a new number. And that systematic interval nature of the data allows you to say very precise things about the impact of one year, getting one year older on your say likelihood to vote. So the best, the richest data that we have is interval level data. The next step down is ordinal data. An example of ordinal data is do you agree with the following statement? Um, blah, 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 from strongly agree to strongly disagree. It's called ordinal because you can rank order the categories from strongly disagree to disagree to neither agree nor disagree to agree to strongly agree. You can put those in an order. But if you compare one step from strongly disagree to disagree, that's a much less precise measure of unit than going from being 15 years old to being 16 years old. That's far more precise. Nominal data is also has less information than ordinal. Ordinal information you can actually put into some categories, right? Like from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Nominal data is just literally names. So it could be Democrat, Republican. It could be North, South, East, West. 
In other words, it's it's named data. It just has its name. And that's why it's nominal. And it's a unit of analysis that is important to to measure, to observe, but we can't rank order Democrats to Republicans. We can't rank order North, South, East, West in a country. They just are what they are and they have an effect or they don't. And finally, we have dichotomous variables. Now, dichotomous variables are a little bit interesting. You can think about them as being nominal. So you could say um, if you, a woman is pregnant or not, that's an on-off. There are two options. She, she's either preg pregnant or she's not. And you can say that that's a nominal category, right? She's either in the non-pregnant category or she's in the pregnant category. You can also weirdly think about dichotomous variables as being ordinal. So a woman who is pregnant is more pregnant than a woman who is not pregnant. Someone who is male is more male than someone who is female. So the way that we treat dichotomous variables can reflect things other than just nominal categories. We can also interpret it in, term to, in terms of an ordinal data value as well. So what? <laughs> Why does the form of data matter? Well, certain types of analysis can only be conducted on certain types of data. Interval level data, for instance, you can conduct a correlation analysis. Uh, you can look at the dependent variable using ordinary least squares regression. With ordinal data, you can also do a cross tab. Sometimes you can do an ordinary least squares regression if you've got several of these strongly agree to disagree combined into a scale, but it's not going to give you the precision that an interval level scale would provide. With nominal data, you can do cross tabs and multinomial logistic regression. And with dichotomous variables, you can look at correlation, cross tabulation, and you can also use it as a dependent variable in logistic regression. How can you present univariate data analysis? In other words, how can you communicate the information by looking simply at one variable? There are three basic ways that you can convey that kinds of uh, univariate or one variable information, pie charts, bar charts, and histograms. A pie chart is really just designed to convey information with a simple visual representation. I love this joke. I, I, I know I'm a geek because I find this hilarious and I laugh every time I see it. Pie charts can be a good way to represent frequency, percents, and proportions. Tables often present numerical distributions of data and are often used to represent frequencies, percents, and proportions as well. And here there's an example of the percentage of respondents by rank of their agreement or disagreement with a statement. A histogram is a graphical display of tabulated frequencies shown as bars. This would be, for instance, like the what you would see in a normal curve, and you're just dis, you're displaying how everybody ranks according to the frequencies um, that you have observed. Another form of descriptive statistics, and you'll see this a lot again with re reports on the campaigns about Democrats and Republicans supporting Clinton or Trump, men and women supporting Clinton or Trump. It's a cross tabulation. It's, it's another way that we call it is a bivariate analysis. I think it also can be referred to as a joint frequency table, but shorthand people just say cross tabs. So I'm going to be using that phrase a lot. And by putting two variables into a table that are lining up describing each other, you can look at the associations between the two variables, the direction of any relationship you see, you can evaluate the strength of the relationship you see, and you can also use a statistical test to determine whether or not the difference is statistically significant. That is to say whether you can generalize from your sample to the wider population saying that we definitely think that this relationship that exists in my, the sample also exists in the wider population. But this description, this attribution of a relationship, an association in your wider population is descriptive. It's not causal. You're not saying that being a man causes you to respond with the answer a lot, whereas being a woman causes you to respond with the answer, let's say, some. What we're saying is that in this population, men say a lot and women say some. And that's it. That's as far as you can go. Another way that you can describe your statistics by looking at the content, the information within your variable, is to measure central tendencies. And this is a method of capturing a feature of the data that says, what does the typical case look like? 
in statistical packages, they're often described as your summary statistics, and they will be calculated into your mode, your median, your mean, and also provide a standard deviation. For those of you who um, are, are reaching back into your maths course, trying to remember what each of these are, the mode is the one that comes up the most often. So whatever number appears, if you've got a five point scale and four is the most commonly provided answer, your modal answer will be four. The median is the number that comes up in the exact middle. So if you write out all of the, your responses in um, order of, of ascending order from lowest to highest, and whatever one is right smack dab in the middle, that's going to be your median. Your mean is when you have all of your observations, you add them all up and divide by the number of observations to get the average value on that variable for your sample. That's the mean. The standard deviation I'm not going to talk about now because it's a little more complicated and we're going to be using it when we look at more sophisticated statistics. The next lecture is going to be on qualitative stuff because we're bouncing back and forth, but the next time we're here for the 202 course on quants, I'm going to be introducing cross tabulations and I'm going to show you how they allow us to observe patterns in the data and evaluate three things. How strong the association between the two variables is, the direction of the association, is it positive or negative, and whether we can extrapolate from our sample to the rest of the population from which that sample was drawn. Alright guys, this is getting your geek on for this week. Thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. I do appreciate your time and attention. And all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I will be talking to you very soon. Bye.